everyone, welcome to this session. Um, I hope you're able to hear me fine. And well, I'm not sure it's necessary that you see me. It's more useful that you hear me. Um, and in a moment, we should have the slides up and then we can get started. And it says it's loading. That's always a good sign. Right, so in this short talk, <clears throat> I want to consider what it meant or could have meant to be a man in the 18th century. And in particular, to consider to what extent the ability to vary ideas of manliness were related to social status and political power. And finally, I want to consider the reactions of 18th century society to these possible variations and what by the end of the century was meant by being a man. Now, in the 18th century, a Molly referred to an effeminate male or a sodomite, it, it, they not the same, necessarily the same group. A Molly's in a sense then were precursor to the homosexual identity of the modern century, though it's not clear that anyone ever called themselves a Molly. A Molly house um, was a term for a tavern or private room where people met up possibly for same sex encounters, sexual encounters, but also for social encounters. And I'll talk more about that in just a moment. And most larger towns in England had molly houses. Um, and these were then somewhat like a modern gay bar. Now, the most famous of these, there was one in, called the Devere Street Club, but the most famous was probably Mother Clapp's Molly House in Field Lane in Holborn, London. It was, um, well, where it was is underneath the Holborn Viaduct now. In the 18th century, males in England were prosecuted under sodomy laws, for which the penalty was death by hanging. The court records of their trials are the main documentary evidence we have of such establishments as Molly Houses that we have access to today. Now, on the 9th of May, 1726, the three men, Lawrence Griffin and Thomas Wright, were hanged at Tyburn for sodomy. And Charles Hitchin, who was the under city marshal, so somewhat like a police lord, a police officer, but he was also a crime lord. He used his position um, effectively for graft. He was also convicted in 1727 of attempted sodomy at a Molly house. Now, this was entirely based on the evidence of undercover informants. You see them kind of peeking through the door in, in the bottom picture. In other words, it was sort of sting operations. Patrons of Molly houses, they were called Mollies, often dressed in women's clothing, as you see in the picture. Um, they took on female persona affected effeminate mannerisms and speech, and sometimes gave themselves women names through a form of baptism, which usually involved a glass of gin being thrown in their face. And even sometimes pretended to give birth, quite often to a wheel of cheese. Now, the interesting thing about Molly houses is they were frequented by people of the lower classes. So cabbies and dock workers and stable boys and footmen. Now, this was a clear social concern because these men moved in and out of good houses. So it's hardly surprising that this behavior prompts a reaction. And this reaction comes much earlier than what I've just shown you about the Molly houses being raided. That's kind of the end of the process. But let's step back to the end of the 17th century. The Society for the Reformation of Manners was founded in the aftermath of the Glorious Revolution because of concerns about levels of indecency and immorality in society. In particular, there was a concern about buggery and sodomy and the corruption of young men. There was less interest in women in general, though prostitutes, especially lower class streetwalkers and cheap brothels were also targeted. The courtesan, or the well-paid mistress, on the other hand, was not of anyone's concern. Daniel Defoe was a member in Edinburgh, though there's some evidence to suggest he joined it as a joke. And there, there is quite a bit of suggestion that leading individuals in society made fun of this group and sometimes joined just as a laugh. The society was well organized, following the patterns of hierarchy of the day. Gentlemen were at the top and responsible for finance, and you see the pattern laid out here. Then there was the business end, the secondary society, which in particular used the coercion of blacklisting to keep merchants in line. So if tradesmen dealt with a Molly house, they could find themselves blacklisted. 
There were private constables, remember there's no real police force at this time, who made arrests and initiated private prosecutions with a view of destroying reputations. Again, like blacklisting. And finally, there were informants, such as those who went undercover in Mother Clapp's Molly House. Now, leading members of society were active members and supporters. In addition to attacks on Molly houses, as I've said, they were keen to root out red light districts. The society denounced Covent Garden, for example, in 1770, calling it the greatest square of Venus crowded with the practitioners of this goddess. One would imagine that all the prostitutes in the kingdom had decided on this neighborhood. In other words, although there is a somewhat of a focus on Molly houses and same-sex activities, this is really a society that's really concerned about sexual immorality in general. And you'll notice in the picture here the mention of, of the attempt to talk to people of all ranks. And the society was active in um, producing publications, advancing its works, and most importantly, warning of the dangers at hand. This helps to stir up and keep alive a sense of moral panic. Effectively, there's a, a sexually immoral pervert under every bed or under behind every door, or worse, downstairs amongst your servants. Now, in the, the previous one, you saw a picture of the frontispiece of a work by Jonathan Swift, um, who seems to be supportive, but if you read it carefully, you get a sense that he's also making fun of the society. Now, the society peaked in its power and activity in 1725 with the raids on Molly houses throughout England, which effectively ended them for the foreseeable future. And then brothels and prostitutes were targeted the following two years with somewhat less success, it has to be said. And of course, one of the reasons is, is, is a Molly house, the people in them were risking death. People involved in prostitution were not. Now, what about elite men? And, and here I want to look at the example of John Harvey, because I think he, he throws up the considerable difference between society's attitude towards the elite and what an elite man can do and be compared to someone of the lower orders. He was a great friend of Frederick, son of George II, uh, the father of George III. He died before he could become king. He was um, Prince of Wales for a while. Um, Harvey was educated at Clare College, Cambridge, and he was elected in 1725 as MP for Bury St. Edmunds. He married um, uh, Mary Lepple, a lady-in-waiting to the Prince of Wales' wife, which gives you an idea of how sort of intertwined he was with uh, Prince Frederick. He fell out with Frederick after quarrel in 1723, which seems to be over the affections of Anne Vane. In other words, they were both um, after the same woman. He was a staunch supporter of Walpole, and his political profile made him an easy target of Walpole's opponents. And you get some titles here, which were sort of attacks back and forth. He even ended up in a physical duel as a result of anti pulteney satires and was injured. He barely lived. He was Lord Privy Seal in 1740, but dismissed when Walpole fell. When he died, his son forbade the publication of his memoirs until after the death of George III, which was quite a long time later, because they were scandalous. Pope hated him politically and personally. In particular, Harvey and Pope um, engaged in another duel, but this time literary, in which Harvey again came off the worse. And they seemed to have really been arguing um, because they both wanted to be friends or perhaps more than friends with La Lady Mary Wortley Montague, um, and she seems to have preferred Harvey. Now, the quotation by Pope about Sporus, everyone knew he was talking about Harvey, gives an idea of the invective and the way in which it focused on ideas of femininity and masculinity. These men are not having physical duels. As I said, Harvey had, was quite capable of having one, but they're slagging each other off in print. And in Harvey's case, the wit leveled against him relates to his manliness. In other words, here's a man who was able to have a duel, but he's being accused of being not quite a man. 
Now, what is really interesting is the rumors which swirled around Harvey's sex life. He was associated with Algaretti, who was later made a Prussian count by Frederick the Great, and may have been um, Frederick the Great's lover for a time. What is clear that, is that Harvey certainly had lovers of both sexes and seemed to have done so fairly openly and also fathered a number of children. While in a relationship with Stephen Fox, he lived almost wholly apart from his wife and he and Stephen entertained guests as a couple. What seemed to have made his relationship with Fox so titillating to the, uh, wider community was that Harvey was originally linked to Stephen's brother, Henry, first Baron Holland and Secretary of War, who was tipped to be a future Whig Prime Minister. In other words, this, we're talking about the top of society. What is most interesting, though, is that while Pope and others attacked Harvey's manliness, they never made specific attacks related to his sexuality. Indeed, it seems that Harvey as a fop, a kind of effeminate man, was an easier target than Harvey as a sodomite, probably because that was a lot harder to prove in law and might have occasioned a suit of defamation. Now, a century earlier, Harvey probably would have been a socially popular rake like the Earl Rochester. In other words, the kind of name given to this behavior and the focus of this behaviors in the eyes of society would have been slightly different. And it's, it's this image of the fop that I think we need to think about. A man with social status and power who was able to live in a way which clearly occasioned comment and criticism. That's what we're talking about. That's who Harvey was. In effect, this image was the underlying target of the Society for the Reparation of Manners. The fop was a problem. Now let's consider the image of the fop as it developed in theater, noting the importance of the developing combination of feminine sexual acts and unmanly behavior. Now, this is a quotation from a, about a male fop called Maiden, in Thomas Baker's Turbridge Walks uh, stage play of 1703. Notice the use of bow in a derogatory sense, as well as the reference to coffee house fellows, normal manly men. This is camp. You can't imagine the lines being delivered without a simper or two, and one almost expects the character to be in drag, and there's probably a good chance that they may well have been partially in drag. So this is no longer the rake, the very butch man who has sex with men and women. This is now the man who has sex with men and women and is a bit too much like a woman. However, the image isn't all that simple. Notice how Maiden talks about his relationships with other men. Remember this is on stage and it's meant to get a laugh, but it probably had enough truth about it to sting a little bit. In other words, people would have probably known people that they kind of thought of like this. And you can imagine why people like Wilberforce in the society were upset. If people found this funny, they might also find it socially acceptable or tolerable. The Society of, of, for the Reformation of Manners clearly wanted a don't ask, don't talk about, and don't portray it on stage view. And, and you see what he's saying. I, you know, This is a man who says, I can sing and dance. Um, I, I can dress up a lady. In other words, I can, I can help a, a woman dress. Um, used to work as a milliner, where, but a man took fancy to me and he left me in a state. And you see, he's, he's sort of saying, this person is just accepted in this society. Now, again, note the candor of the discussion. Um, this reference to John Noakes and John Lay. These, okay, one is, a, is, a, is meant to be a witty poem. The other one is, a, if you will, an encyclopedia entry. This isn't Victorian euphemism. It's blunted in one's face. And for all the venom in the first, it's clear that Chetwood in the second had no sense he was making a criticism of Lay, simply making an observation. Also note the use of the word taste, which seems to apply some notion of preference. One finds, even in the mid-16th century, the use of appetite in a very similar way. In other words, just because the word homosexual didn't exist doesn't mean people didn't have an idea that some people had certain preferences which were inclined to same-sex attraction. At best, wider society found it amusing and tolerable in polite society, 
At worst and increasingly, it was seen as dangerous and corrupting. It needed to be pushed off the stage and out of polite drawing rooms into alleys and closets. The lower orders could be arrested. The elite needed to be shamed and ostracized. And of course, that was the point. Amusing and tolerable was not much protection against the society and its use of public humiliation. Molly's had no chance and faced the full weight of the law. The fop was also the, atar also the target of attack though, and here we see why. There, are there is a coalescing of the Molly with the fop. The image is not complete, not just amusing. Some of these fops are big beefy guys, porters and working class types. And how do you spot them? They have a way of talking and walking and they also use nicknames. And we remember the previous thing I said about Molly's uh, baptizing and giving each other female names. And again, when we think about, did people have an idea of people with preferences and tastes? Well, they had an idea that you could spot people with these preferences and tastes by their mannerisms. And that is really, really interesting. And again, it suggests that it isn't just about not talking about this. They want the Society for the Reformation of Manners wants to control how people talk and walk and interact with their friends. Still, the direction of society's image is obvious. It is about being feminine. That's the problem with the fop. This is no longer the amusing rake who is a real man because he could bed anyone and everyone regardless of gender. No, this is the man who has become or is becoming a woman. The emphasis here on feminine and the confusion of gender is obvious. The fop is no longer amusing and fun to have at dinner parties. The fop is a dangerous devolution from man, the higher form, to woman, the lesser, more dangerous form. And here you think about all the comments about Eve in the Bible, for example. So for the 18th century, the fop was an increasing problem. And for members of the Society for the Reformation of Manners, the fop needed to be eradicated. Let's let Garrick have the last word. And we see that for him, the problem is confusion. Wit is a rake, a pretender, a woman dressed as a man. But now the question is, what is it, this person? This is the key question. It is no longer a man's man, but not yet a woman. But the movement is in that direction, and that is devolution, not evolution. So what happens next? Well, for all of that, the fop doesn't disappear, though the name changes. In the early 19th century, you get the dandy, and by the later 19th century, you have people like Oscar Wilde, the aesthete. And Let's be honest, the fop survives through the ages, even to the present day. Johnny Depp's character in the Pirates of the Caribbean franchise is pure fop. The fop remains, or I think more importantly, is again amusing and fun to have around. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, please refer, well, I have one already. You've referred to poems and plays which treat this topic. Are there sources and diaries and letters? Um, you, you don't have, well, yes, in a sense, because you've got someone like Harvey writing in his diaries, but they're so scandalous, no one wants them published. And, and remember, the heirs, um, well, the, the lawyers who got Byron's estate fed his entire, all of his memoirs, letters, and everything else to the fire. They were so horrified by what they were reading. So I think this is part of the problem. Even if people put these things into writing, a lot of times this doesn't survive because that stuff comes into the hands of their heirs and their heirs want it gone. This is why something like Jane, um, by Anne Lister's diaries are so important because they, they, they weren't destroyed. So we have no idea of how much was destroyed. Plays survive criminal court cases survive and that tends to give us a kind of a very skewed view of what was going on because what doesn't survive is what effectively sons and grandchildren and nephews and nieces found too horrifying it's well worth remembering that an awful lot of victoria's private correspondence was fed to the fire by her daughters it took them days to go through it and burn it because they were so worried about what was there probably a lot of stuff about um 
Mr. Brown and, and her um, Indian servant. Um, thank you very much. Um, Amanda's asking, such an interesting talk. Does the term mollycoddling come from this time? Um, well, it looks like it does. It's the sort of word, it sounds like an 18th century word, um, but, but I don't know. Um, I'd have to look it up to see whether it has, whether it may be that a molly is called a molly because molly is a word that already exists that may mean sort of just soft. So molly coddling is treating something softly and a molly is an effeminate man, a soft man. That's certainly the, the sort of terminology you get in the ancient world is soft is often seen as the way you derogatorily call a man effeminate. You say soft. Okay. Um, I've kind of got a, a, I guess it's kind of a question. It's, it's more, uh, um, you did the talk before, you know, about um, Anne Lister and, um, and on that topic, and that was really interesting. And I remember you saying then that it was um, quite often that was seen as quite entertaining to people, you know, they would go around and visit and it was like, you know, there's just this, this thing that people couldn't get their heads around. Was there a, a level of, I, I know it's, it's, a, it's a different situation, but was there a level of entertainment um, in this as well? Did people kind of treat it the same way or very differently? It, I mean, it's very clear that there is a difference in the attitude society generally has to women who are close chums. Because they, because, well, remember, lesbianism is not a crime. Um, and so it's it's kind of understandable the society by which I mean men of the time can understand women who don't want to get married because they don't want to get pregnant they don't want to die in childbirth they kind of understand this female behavior and and even when it's dressing as men they understand that because remember in the mind of men of the time a woman pretending to be a man is a woman trying to better herself she's evolving a man pretending to be a woman is going in the other direction and and there there's always going to be the hint of sexual acts about it which of course is a capital crime having said that it's very clear that that certainly through the early part of the 18th century at least on stage the fop although is a, someone you ridicule is also someone funny and 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 amusing um, and there's a lot of and there is a lot of concern about that there's even a lot of concern I mean one of my favorite things is the sort of a panic in in early um, Georgian England about the the presence of Italian castrati on the stage and and that women are having them around to for dinner parties and tea and really love these castrati and men are horrified English men because they think the reason the women like them is because these are men they can use but not get pregnant by which is also the same reason a lot of 18th century treatises attack dildos. They just think that men are replaceable in, for most women, and that, that worries them. I think what worries them about fops is that this is men becoming women. Absolutely, yeah, that's really interesting. And I hadn't actually thought of it in the way you were saying, you know, about um, it, for women, it's like progression, you know, it's like they're, they're trying to better themselves, but in the opposite direction, it's something else entirely. Um, so Matthew's asking, do you think the lower class association of Mollies was also a factor in upper class circles changing their views on friends that might be considered fops? I think probably. Um, I think that in 1725, the, the raids on Molly houses got a lot of publicity in the press. And I, and I think what, and people were horrified that these places existed. And it, and it wasn't just that the press talked about the places, the press talked about the behavior of people and described how they walked. And it, it told you that, you know, um, someone in, in an alleyway that, that um, I don't know if you can see that would tap the back of the hand with two fingers. That was tr someone trying to pick you up. So all of a sudden you get a society that just sees this stuff, which before had not been visible because it's now in newspapers. And I think it just sensitizes them. And then when they look around, the FOP is, is no longer just an, indiv an amusing individual. The FOP is now the tip of an iceberg. And I think that's what really worries people. Um, okay. yeah, Chloe, yeah, Chloe's asking about the, um, uh, do you feel the perception of Molly's changed throughout the 19th century or is it just the terminology that changed? Um, so there's certainly dandies early, you know, <clears throat> So I think Molly is a word that just does seem to disappear for sort of lower working class 
men who want to do stuff with men. Fop becomes dandy, um, and you have you have dandies throughout the 19th century, pretty much. Um, I think Oscar Wilde tries to use the word esthete. I think he tries to use it because it's in a, a dandy just implies someone who dresses in a careful way, and if, an esthete, I think, kind of implies someone who was better than everyone else. Um, they were sort of more clued in and stuff like that. Thank you very much. Um, Amanda saying that she recognised Hugh Laurie in the Regency Blackadder. Was it acceptable for the Regency to be fought? I think then you were a dandy. Um, and I think there the the emphasis is is less. So the fop is seen as as someone who's a bit effeminate. The dandy is someone who cares a lot about their appearance, but isn't necessarily. If you in a lot of those quotations, you'll have noticed they hint that fops in some way cross dressed a little bit. Don't and dandies don't do that. So I think the the dandy doesn't have quite the same connotation though I think probably still had in social terms amongst most men a kind of a question mark. Uh, great, thank you very much. Um, I'll ask as well, is there, you know, we're talking, we're talking about the 18th century, but, um, you know, how far, how far back can you find examples similar to this? Is it, is it, is it really around the time or is there stuff before this? Well, I, th I think it depends on what you mean. If, if you mean, um, sort of regular working class people being involved in same sex activities. Well, I mean, I don't think you find a time when you don't find that. Yeah. Um, at the sort of elite level, well, yeah, because James the Sixth and first had his favorites. Um, Henry the Third of France had a bunch of people who were called his, his mignon, which kind of means like tasty little tidbits. Um, and, and the association there was very clearly in both cases that there, this was a bit unacceptable. Um, so yeah, you do get that and you couple that with at the same time, um, you know, prosecutions of just sort of regular working class people. Um, my favorite is, is, is in the, well, sort of in the 16th, early 16th century, Florence sets up a police force called the kind of the night patrol and their job is to go out and sort of put an end to all of this stuff going on in the alleyways. Um, they do such a good job that Florence gets a reputation for being a hotbed of sodomy. And so eventually they get rid of the police force because it's so much less embarrassing if you just don't look for it. Um, and I think, I think that that's really what the society of, of manners is going on about. And I think if you think about this, this sort of don't, don't say gay in Florida, there is a sense in which there's a social reaction that says, we're not really concerned, oh, there's a kitty cat. We're not really concerned so much about the behavior as we're concerned about it being seen publicly in a way that then suggests that it's socially publicly acceptable that that's what you want. It isn't so much that there's a problem with people being gay or being a lesbian, as long as they do it in a closet. It's when it's public. And I think this is what the Society for the Reformation of Manners is so horrified by, because when they look, what they see horrifies them. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You work your assassination all the time. Um, if, if you want to slur someone's character, this is you accuse them. Um, of, of being a, a sodomite. Now, and this causes us all kinds of problems because in the past, it's so someone like James the Sixth and First, it's hard to know whether people who are accusing him of being sexually inappropriate are doing it for political reasons or because they're really horrified by his behavior. And, and part of the problem is, is the way in which we respond to that sort of an accusation. I mean, if someone accused Henry VIII of being an, a horrible, nasty husband and a wife killer and a serial adulterer, you would just go, yeah, of course. You wouldn't think, well, is this political? If someone accuses James VI of being way too friendly with his favorites, then, oh, maybe this is all just political and he really wasn't. I think that's that's requiring a different level of evidence in certain cases than you do in other cases and it's slightly problematic but it is clear that it is a way in which you assassinate someone's character hence okay. hence the society for the reformation of manners understanding that blast blacklisting was really effective 
Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And Chloe was also asking, what were the attitudes of other countries towards Molly's, following on from what you've just said about um, Florence? Um, well, so you 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 have to um, if if you if you look at different places and different times, mostly what we get is from criminal court records. So, in the in the eighteenth century, we see a pol the police force is in Paris is really really focused on spotting people in the in the parks in particular um and they they describe you know this is how you spot a sodomite and they call them sodomy patrols and they describe the way people walk the way they dress the way they talk um we have a lot of of cases in the 18th century in the netherlands related to lesbianism for some strange reason and and it appears what what seems to happen is there are certain periods in different places where the elite look actively look and they find things unsurprisingly most of the time they don't look but where they do look there's so much evidence that suggests is it just that you know 18th century amsterdam had like a lesbian plague or is it just there was a lot of it about but most people it never shows up in the records because no one gets arrested because the state doesn't look for it the same thing is true here were Molly houses just, did they just sort of appear in the 1720s? I doubt it. Yeah, thank you. And um, Ellen is asking, when did the hanging stop and other punishments took over? Well, so now this is very interesting. In the early 19th century, a whole lot of crimes that had the death penalty are effectively suffering jury nullification. So juries are refusing to convict people for things that are gonna get them hanged if they don't think they should be hanged. So, you know, a 12 year old stealing a loaf of bread gets acquitted even when the judge instructs the jury to convict. So you get a big reform in the middle of the 19th century and a whole lot of crimes stop being capital crimes and become imprisonable crimes. And, and sodomy is, isn't one of them, but what you get is the creation of a new crime called gross indecency. Now we have to remember, Oscar Wilde was prosecuted for sodomy and acquitted. He's actually convicted for gross indecency for which the punishment was two years hard labor. The average life expectancy, if you're sentenced to hard labor, is one year. But juries seem to not care about that because they don't see it as a death penalty. And the, and the reason why you have to bring in gross indecency is because the state realizes, and, and realizes spectacularly, that it's almost impossible to con convict for sodomy. So technically, to convict someone of sodomy, you either have to have a confession or you have to have two eyewitnesses, not only to penetration, but to ejaculation. Now, you can imagine that's really hard to get a jury to convict on. So what they want is, is they want a way to deal with both jury nullification and the fact that some crimes are really hard to convict. So what they do is they create a whole new set of crimes that carry prison sentences and not the death penalty. And they find juries will go along with that. Okay, thank you. Um, Chloe's also just asking, um, does the prosecution really begin to build in the 17th and 18th century, meaning the prosecution and the people looking for it? Um, well, um, no. Um, I, well, it's hard to say whether it builds <clears throat> because I, one of the problems is, is when we talk about prosecutions, we think of a state that has a police force that investigates crimes. Prior to the establishment of, of police forces in really in the 19th century, most prosecutions are start as private prosecutions. In other words, someone goes to the state and complains, which is why informers were so important in the Molly houses. They went to the state and said, let me tell you what's going on there. And then the state would respond. So if you don't have the population complaining a great deal, then you tend not to have prosecution. So I think the more interesting question is, is why does society get concerned? So, and you could say this, why does the society at certain times get concerned about witchcraft? Why does society get concerned at certain times about sodomy? Why does Amsterdam in the 18th century seem to care about lesbianism? That's, it's much harder to answer that question. But the key thing is, is, is to remember that crimes, cr 
criminal trials don't start the same way mm -hmm. and investigations don't go the same way then as they do now. Thank you very much. Um, that seems to be it for questions. Um, we've got plenty of time if anyone wants to add anything in. Uh, we're definitely a smaller group than anticipated today. And as we said, I think our UK um, contingent, a lot of people have abandoned us for the sunshine because <laughs> it's uh, certainly made an appearance this week. Uh, which we don't we don't take lightly at all. Um, Eleanor is asking, can you name any literary characters uh, from the time who would be considered Fox or Molly? Um, characters in th they it tends to be something that shows up mostly in plays, um, and 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 they do have these weird names like Maiden. Um, I'm not sure about so Smollett would probably have fops in his works. Byron is later, but definitely, yes. Um, what you do with someone like the Earl of Rochester and all of his characters is an entirely different discussion. Um, you know, I mean, he writes a play called Sodom, well, called The Quintessence of Sodom, which was, I think, performed once in front of the court and then the court banned it. It wasn't performed again until the 1960s. It is shockingly appalling, mostly because the characters have such repulsive names. Um, so, so um, I th I, yeah, I think people like Smollett, um, the Marquis de Sade's works would probably have fops in them, not probably Molly's, if you're talking about sort of lower order people, probably not. But Fops is sort of socially prominent and funny, yes. Perfect, thank you. Um, June Singh, you said about people joining and then claiming they had done it as a joke. Is this sometimes a case of he protests too much? Um, I, I'm not sure that, for example, Defoe and Swift <clears throat> claimed it was a joke. I, I just think that you look at the sort of and it suggests that they, they're not really taking this seriously. Um, I mean, Swift. Swift Swift's book sounds, his treatise sounds like, you know, a, a defense uh, against adultery and stuff like that. But you read it and think, this is a very clever man who writes very witty stuff. It's hard to read this without think it's thinking it's tongue in cheek. Um, Defoe, well, is a kind of a social climber. He's, well, he's a spy for one thing, but he's, he, he probably joined as much for social prominence as for anything else but maybe also just because he thought it was funny. But they don't ever claim that's what they've done. So in that sense, I don't think it's, I don't think they're trying to defend themselves after the fact. I, I think we look at it and, and see, and let's face it, probably a lot of people joined, joined this society for the reformation of manner in the same way that people went along with the, you know, blacklisting of actors in 1950s America. Um, they probably thought, these are a bunch of prigs and prudes, but I don't want to be blacklisted. Super, thank you so much. I think that's it. If uh, you've got your last chance, everyone, if there's any more burning questions, anything that springs to mind, then please do put it in the chat just now. Um, otherwise, um, we will wrap up and then uh, everyone can get out into their gardens. Um, <laughs> thank you so much, Bill, uh, as always. For taking and thank the time you to today. everyone for everyone yeah it's really appreciated we're so glad you were able to to speak on this it's such an interesting subject that, that's a good question has the dandy evolved and bears another name well i mean what would you call um johnny depp's character captain jack i'm, I'm not sure that we necessarily because there's no question that but captain jack is heterosexual mm -hmm. but what would we call someone like that um metrosexual but probably a bit too camp for that i think yeah, we would probably say it was just camp mm -hmm. i think probably is what we would call it but i don't think we, we that's an adjective i don't know that we necessarily have a noun for it today yeah amanda agrees she said just camp <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah so again thank you so much bill thank you everybody who um has taken some time today to come and join us for this discussion it's really appreciated we are going to be putting out more online events and um, Chloe and I are going to be plotting very soon about our next series. Um, so I'm sure we'll be inviting Bill back <laughs> um, to speak with us again. And um, okay. so, yes, <laughs> thanks, Bill. And thank you, everybody. And enjoy the rest of your day. Right. Thanks a lot. Bye bye. Take care. Bye.